Yeah, I don't have a, a presentation on co-housing, so, uh, but it is uh, our impulse to create things like co-housing and uh, change the way we're living uh, our lives on the planet. Um, so, so nobody left. That's that's good. <laughs> So uh, I'll just start with uh, a quote. Um, oh, friend, I love you. Think this over carefully. If you are in love, then why are you asleep? My inside, listen to me. The great spirit, the greatest spirit, the teacher is near. Wake up, wake up. Run to his feet. He is standing close to your head right now. You have slept for millions and millions of years. Why not wake up this morning? Friend, wake up. Why do you go on sleeping? The night is over. Do you want to lose the day the same way? Other women have managed to get out early and have already found an elephant or a jewel. So much was lost already while we, you slept, and that was so unnecessary. So obviously you already have jewels and elephants with you. And, um, and so I start with wake up in that this idea of connecting to me starts with that we've in some ways been asleep um, on some level as a culture. Um, uh, and this is a group, I think, that's waking up to a different way. And how you play that out can be many different things. It may be just the way you'll go home and change your room. Or it might be you'll go home and uh, look at, well, am I living where uh, it supports really a, a higher sense of self and my lifestyle? Um, or is it, I'm going to start a co-housing community and bring uh, that process into my life and end up with something that is deeply an extension of, of a deeper sense of self. So, um, so wake up. I really put that in for me because I was afraid I'd be half asleep still at 8, 8 o'clock is an early one. But, the, but if we then go back, just take a peek at sort of the pathology that builds up that, that maybe put us asleep or, or happened while we were asleep, suburbanization, um, isolation. Um, I think it's separation um, and that it's happening all around us. I, I'm sure we all have examples of walking into a restaurant and everybody's sitting there on their, their device and they're separated. Um, uh, there's uh, housing types that sort of have developed uh, over the years that are sort of um, part of that sense of separation and, and uh, linearity, I guess. Um, and, and it's something that I think we're, we're waking up to. This isn't working. And I think there's a lot of people with hair my color here, but I think the young people are waking up even before us. And I think it's a really exciting time in that respect, that they're wanting to live in cities. They're, they're not necessarily having a car or even wanting a car. Um, and, uh, and it's our generation that almost is having to catch up to them. And, and I think the waking up that's happening with the Me Too movement, that suggests that women have woken, and they've been awake, but now they're actually gaining the power that they deserve. Damn right. <laughs> The same with, with our kids and the young people that are, are waking up and saying, you know, it's time to, to get something done because it's not going to happen for us. We have to make it happen, which is another uh, aspect of co-housing, make it happen. So I, I, again, I have a perspective of design looking at different scales. So I have to come to you today as an architect and, and share some of these lessons I've learned over 40 years on projects. And it really goes, this is uh, Saarinen talking in 1948, the year I was born. And it's uh, always design a thing considering it in its next larger context. A room, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city plan. And so I, I think it, yesterday I was at one of the sessions and somebody asked, well, is there a formula that you can just give me to make this co-housing happen? And, and uh, in some ways there are formulas, but I think we live in a culture that expects formulas now. A quick way of getting to the end. A, a quick way of, of solving these things because we're so busy. And so first of all we have to slow down 
and actually pay attention to where we are and what we're trying to accomplish and, and trust the process a bit. So I'm gonna just start real roughly at the big scale of you're gonna select where you're living and how we're going to make cities. For the designers out there, we start with a bigger picture of how do we knit a, a, uh, a system that has been created in this country usually. Most of our cities and suburban areas have really happened in a diverse way. So we're gonna to try to knit them back together. And it's an impulse that is happening in this country. You see over and over the cities are starting to reclaim uh, the downtowns. Uh, we are getting rail systems. Uh, we are getting transportation and mixed use that allows people to live in more clustered arrangements. The things we love about Europe when we travel, we think, oh wow, you can walk everywhere. I don't have to jump in a car. So I would say in terms of co-housing, think about where that land is that you're going to build this community and make sure that it is embedded in, in a larger system. So it's systems thinking. And, and think about where am I gonna get my groceries? How will I get them? Do I have to jump in the car every time? And maybe it's okay, and maybe in the community you can have somebody that's bringing the groceries and you're storing more on site. There are ways, but think about uh, sort of the, the larger context of where you're, you're gonna be. And then we always just, over and over remind ourselves that climate and place are, are the things that really drive architecture. So site, site and climate is where we begin. And I would say for you, that if you're thinking of a co-housing community, again, it's not one size fits all. You start with, well, where am I? What does uh, this climate demand of us? What does it have available to celebrate? What does it have um, that um, is changing? Because in a, a climate that is not a static thing, we also have to think of, well, what's, what's happening? In our foothills, they're, they're burning, yep. and then they're flooding. And so you have to think about, well, where am I uh, in a warming planet? Um, and so, uh, there, but ultimately, I think you also want to think about the beauty of where you are, whether that's in a city, or whether it's a natural environment and celebrate the sense of place. And keep reminding yourself as you're going through the process about that because it's a long process to make anything and especially a community collectively. And so in that you have to sort of have touchstones that you go, go back to and, and remind yourselves why, why are we doing this? And sometimes those things are the things that happen early in the process and don't just sweep those under the rug and say, okay, now we gotta get to the, get this thing over with. And there will be times when you'll wanna do that too. I, I'm, I'm not a fool. Well, that's a debatable point, but. Um, so this idea of, of, of climate place also relates to energy and carbon. And so this whole uh, impulse toward uh, uh, saving this planet is also embedded, I think, in the people in this room, I would think, and why, partly why you're doing this is beyond yourself. It's, it's for our children and for the other uh, two and four leggeds. And, and so this is uh, ultimately about sustainability. And that's what we've sort of hung our hat on for 40 years. But I hate to even use the words anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's there and it's a big thing. Um, but it's embedded in all these decisions. So first of all, I'm just gonna say, make great public spaces. Um, and so I, I'm using the holiday neighborhood because I think some of you have probably been over there um, for some of the sessions. And it's a neighborhood that uh, we were uh, uh, fortunate to be able to design with the Boulder Housing Partners. And it was taking an old drive-in theater site um, that was sort of, a, a, in a way, a relic to the auto culture and turn it into a mixed use uh, affordable housing community. And so the idea was, the big idea was, let's try to do a community that's woven together, that mixes uh, market rate and affordable housing in a way that you can never tell which is which. That it doesn't stigmatize affordable housing, it celebrates community together and that the diversity formed by a marriage of, of uh, 
of, of affordable housing and market rate as, as simple ways to saying it also brings more diversity into that community and certainly Boulder needs any way to get some diversity <laughs> because we're becoming a monoculture and uh, pricing our way out of being a diverse community that's a longer discussion. There's all you know, all kinds of things we could stand around and talk to, but we have 40 minutes. Oh, I'm going to go back a second. Um, so we started with a, with a, a tool we often use, and that's Legos. And so we, we in working with the groups and listening, and uh, um, oh, oh, see, Leslie makes everything work for me. You know, <laughs> Um, thank you. So we start with Legos here and then we model different options and so a lot of what I'll show you is making the process visible. If we're going to design in community collectively and that's a big part of what to me co-housing is about. It's designing with one another versus someone designing just for you. That you have to make that process uh, accessible and, and, uh, and something that you can actually affect. And, and I'll show you some tools we used over the years. So the site plan is really um, around a central living room, which is where the old cars used to park. So there were two screens. There was a screen up here and a screen down here in the radio parking. And when we got this approved, uh, I described this park as sacred landscape because a lot of Boulderites may have been conceived on that site. <laughs> and so it was treated as a special place. And so this idea of um, the mix then is trying to get density. And you know, Jerry Brown, uh, I think, coined the term elegant density. And that's often what we go back to because in some ways, sprawl is bad. We all are anti-sprawl. And yet density is bad. And so then, well then, where the hell do we go? I mean, it's, you know, so elegant density is a qualitative way of saying we can live in more clustered uh, arrangements, but there's probably usually a carrying capacity where you've lost it. So it's always trying to find what is the, the amount of density something can really support and a, and a culture and a group can support. You as a co-housing community will have to decide that how dense do we want to be? What's the limit? And what's that going to do to our affordability? What's that do to creating open space and shared outdoor space by, by clustering and densifying? On the other hand, if you reach a point where you no longer have any sense of privacy, then you've kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Because without privacy, it's hard to be fully open to community. Um, you have to have both, I think. Um, so, um, holiday. And so there, it was the old drive-in theater. The first film shown there had been Easy Rider. Um, and so uh, that continues to be uh, a presence on the site. And so there were uh, desires to create more walkability, connection to a transit uh, connection there. So we, we have uh, a place where you don't have to jump in the car all the time. And we got parking reductions for that, and now there are parking problems because still people want to come in their cars. So it's it's we're in transition. You kind of wonder what's the next transition when we get electric cars more, and, and should there be driverless cars, or who knows what the future is. But uh, we have to still recognize that there are um, cars, but there's a lot of other forms of transit and transportation or moving your body. So let's make room for them make outdoor rooms and connections. And so that's really at Holiday was the, the Central Park, was the, the primary room. But then there were also little uh, pocket parks, invest pocket parks, and places where smaller subsets of people could gather in more intimacy. So um, think about your outdoor spaces as much as you think about your, your indoor spaces. Uh, the spaces in between are often what really make life uh, enjoyable and certainly can set up opportunities for chance interactions, um, uh, small arguments that don't get big because um, they're out in public. Um, <laughs> so there's uh, ways that uh, outdoor space should be used and we like, we like to try to shape um, the path so that there's something about the journey that's interesting. 
that we're not always just, again, it's slowing down. And so if you have to get from here to there, you're on a freeway. But if you wanna meander a little, that slows us down and makes us a little more human and then sets up that opportunity for that chance interaction, there's something to that. So I would just, again, suggest to you as you're designing your communities, think about the, the pathways as much as the, uh, the houses. Um, creating a variety of housing types and a mix of affordable with market rate. Again, this is what Holiday was and we're doing, uh, we just finished Kestrel Community in Louisville which tries to do some of the same things. In this, uh, with Holiday, we also master planned in co-housing in it. So there, were, there was a master plan and then we, with the housing partners, hired seven developers and each developer had their own design team. And so you had a certain diversity also in the makers, in the designers. What happens, I think, in larger projects when there's one master plan and then one architect is that it, there's too much sameness. What we love about cities is the diversity, the complexity, the layering of things and different ideas. And yet you don't want chaos. So we're looking for balance between uh, an all out free for all and something that's held so tight that you will learn to live with greatness. Um, so uh, this was really an attempt to bring those groups together and yet we, we, we developed in our studio a set of guidelines and master plans and intentions and lots of slideshows about what if we did this. So there is sort of a guiding vision that tries to be a, tight enough to hold coherence, but loose enough to say, hey, we don't have all the good ideas. Bring your good ideas and bring your good ideas and together it becomes something more. So um, I hope the best of holiday is that there is that diversity and in that is also different housing types for different strokes for different folks. Here's the carriage houses so when we parked cars often we were trying to park above them like the old carriage house and in this case we lined the buildings and backed them to the highway so that we had a we called it the cold shoulder to the highway <laughs> and the open arms to the community. There's times when you need to, to defend against something, whether it's the winds in Boulder, or it could be um, the noise of the traffic next door on one side. So again, not one size fits all. This is what design does, is you're trying to work with the pieces to create something that's integrated and whole. And then the arc houses were along the, the uh, drive-in, and were reflective of that pattern of, of the past and multifamily. So again, little sketches that just started the thinking and then we would work with the design teams to uh, unfold different, um, different uh, approaches. The Studio Muse was a very dense little cluster, is a dense little cluster, and uh, people were working down on the ground and living up above sometimes. And so it, it, it's tough in this culture to push these ideas because you're trying to do this while, while the city's telling us, and, and it's for our own good, I'm sure, but then we have to have uh, you know, access for fighting fires, and, and what if something goes bad, and, and the turning radiuses of this and that, and so it's, we can't become a European city, but we can certainly try to compress certain spaces and then open things back up. So, um, and then single family houses, there, there are small, small houses in there as well. So the, the single family house has, has a lot of advantages in terms of privacy. Not sharing a wall is a nice thing, but it's not the only way to live in, uh, in density. Uh, and the way we can insulate buildings and detail walls, you can get good sound separation. So don't be afraid of shared walls. But again, they're, they're on sidewalks and uh, little parks. One of the things I have noticed in working with other housing, uh, affordable housing groups, is that when we do good master plans like this, and it's not just us, these are happening all over the country, what happens is then there's money invested in making places like this. Sidewalks don't come free. That's why developers usually didn't put them in, uh, in years past. Uh, uh, quality uh, drainage systems, bioswales, um, trails, linkages, open space, all that costs money. 
So then what happens is, in a lot of cases, we're trying to get co-housing in there, but then the land got so expensive, the co-housing group can't afford the land because it's now a, a quality piece of real estate because we did all the right things. And so it's, it's, it's a tension uh, that is hard to solve, but so often co-housing is, everybody loves the idea in these kind of new neighborhoods, but it's often hard to actually get it to pencil out. And then co-housing was the master plan for one block. Our initial concerns with co-housing in here, in that holiday neighborhood was, one, would they be so insular as a community that they wouldn't be good neighbors? It would be kind of a cult. And I, we knew it wasn't a cult. We had done other co-housing communities. But there is a, a strong bond between a group that has gone through designing their own community. That's years of being together. The opposite occurred. These are communitarians. You are communitarians, I would suggest. And actually, you're the perfect seeds to throw out into a larger neighborhood because you're already doing it. You, you know, and the common house can become a, a binding piece where people come together that are outside of your, your core group. Uh, the other thing was is, well, if we have all the openings on the one side toward the green space in the commons, which is a, a line of thinking that Chuck and Katie and you know lots of good good years of thinking well then what happens to the front of the house to the rest of the neighborhood we wanted front porches on all the houses so that this keeps the sidewalk alive and keeps neighborliness going there well it turned out it, they can coexist I mean it's pretty obvious they can coexist but it took us a while to figure that out so you can still have your window over the garden and where the kids are and and have a small front porch that is addressing the street. So set aside a uh, place for community and private gardens, grow your own. In Boulder, you can finance your project by growing your own. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but I think, I think Katie mentioned yesterday that, that gardens are one of the great community magnets. I mean, get people gardening together, and that's where relationships are built. And, uh, and food is, is, is made and celebration can occur seasonally. And it just really is a, a beautiful part. So I would, if you can, figure out how to uh, grow food on your site in whatever way. Even if you're in a city, there's rooftops, there's, um, uh, there's terraces. And so there's ways that, to grow that don't always require huge amounts of land. Bring that garden and these outdoor rooms together and then that creates outdoor spaces that, that allow you to live in smaller spaces uh, in, in most climates. So that, I, I go back to climate, we live in a pretty benign climate, even though you wouldn't know it from the spring. But, um, but some places you're going to be forced inside maybe more, but certainly living inside, outside can reduce the amount of square footage. And again, this idea of the impulse to connect is I think there's an impulse for us to reconnect with nature because we're getting further and further away from it, from our cities to ur urbanization to being isolated on our cell phones. Uh, nature uh, is always out the door there. And so uh, make sure that you've provided for it. And so these are just images of what happens with, with a, a courtyard and, 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 and simple plant material from morning glories, the grapes, um, that aren't always food, but are food, food for the soul. And then ways to open those kind of spaces in a small house, the ability to open some spaces directly so that there's no barrier between you and that nature out there, that garden, that... So, you know, we've used, you know, a sliding glass door is a step, a bifold door is a better step, French door is not a bad step. An overhead garage door works pretty well to open if you're out of the winds because they like to rattle in the winds. And, and sometimes it's just the vision to be able to have a space that, that opens to that visually is also, again, in a climate where you can't be out all the time, make sure there are lenses, Zen views into spaces that uh, will satisfy that, that urge. And so, the, and then the design process, uh, that it's got to be interactive. Um, 
And again, that goes back to there's not one formula. Also, uh, talking at breakfast about the idea of relationships, uh, they're, they're built in this process. And so the process, when we, when we jump the process, you better have another way of building those relationships. And I'm hearing interesting ideas about um, projects that are co-housing or, or co-housing-esque um, that don't necessarily have the full design process as a, a take part um, experience, but then brings people to that site that act as facilitators uh, as people come into the housing. But we, we enjoy the process and the, the Gray Rock community, which some of you might be visiting up in, uh, in Fort Collins uh, tomorrow, I think I heard. Um, it's one of the first co-housing projects we worked on and with uh, my friend Dominic Getleaf, a wonderful uh, Boulder architect. And uh, we started with a, a session of, of making everyone be more responsible for the square footage that they needed to build. We were trying to bring everything down. Small is beautiful. We kept E.F. Schumacher, Canada, small is beautiful. And yet letting go of a need for space for every little thing is a difficult process. And so what we did was we sort of created sessions where we modeled the amount of square feet they think they need and then what does it really take to do those things and then can spaces transform to do them at different times so that you don't have a distinct space for every need. And then we had a session which was great. We got all the um, shoe boxes we could from, from shoe stores in Boulder, <laughs> hauled them up in our pickup trucks and then had each family that was part of the group model the amount of square footage and volume now, because now it's three-dimensionalized. Those shoe boxes worked at one, one half inch equals a foot. And we made the site of the gray rock out of, out of paint tarps on the floor to scale. And then we modeled different ways to arrange those houses in community from sort of the, uh, I remember the one was almost a, like Acoma or a, or Mesa Verde, it was all solar. It was big open arms and we all faced the sun. And it's like the whole, the whole community is a big sun salutation. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. But it doesn't do a lot of other things. And then there were more new urbanist alleyways and, and then circle the wagons. So we had different names for them. And we would mock them up to this big scale. And then people could actually start to experience by walking through, I mean, now we made the model something that was more interactive with your body. Yep. So that you start to understand it um, at another level. And right now, we can do so many things as designers with computers, that there's a bit of a danger. There's more than a bit of a danger. There's a hell of a danger that, uh, <laughs> that um, we bypass the, the, the body, the hand, the heart, and we jump right into the, the more direct way of uh, putting something in a computer and only looking at computer models. And everything is objectified then. It's not experienced. So um, so then we modeled that the, the one that everybody came to collectively. In a way, we called it Circle of the Wagons. And, um, and so it had a perimeter drive and a central green and common house. And so, but this is the, the model we made out of clay as the next level. And then uh, this is actually making it out of sticks and bricks. There's something about seeing things three-dimensionally, literally, not just computer images, but literally, that makes you feel much better when it's being built that, hey, yeah, we know what's going to happen. Because you're trying to bring the surprise. There, some surprise is good. You know, it's the beauty of design. There's good surprises, and then there's bad surprises. We're trying to minimize the bad surprises with, with that. And then sketching and creating these ways. And, and that, this is 20 years later after that was Dominique's sketch of um, the way in. And then the overlooking the, the green. And the common house. Obviously, there, there will be sessions on common houses. It's a really important piece. And so this common house, one of the things we really set on too was daylight. Quality day, it should happen in all spaces, in, in all homes. But the common house especially, if you can't get good rendition with face to face, if you can't see each other in real light, then it's harder to actually communicate. And therefore, again, your bodies 
less involved in this process because daylight animates and activates communication. So um, I hope if you go to Gray Rock, you see the beautiful light in that common house, just as the one up at Wild Sage, uh, the, the Jamie and, and Brian and uh, Jim, Katie, I think there was a whole group of you at, uh, at the one up in Holiday. So this was a recent uh, celebration of 20 years in that community. And it's really vital. And you do see, though, that it's alive and it changes. That uh, That's something to pay attention to. Don't think that you're going to design a community that sort of will lock in and just be one thing. And this group will be the group forever. It's like marriages. How many marriages last forever? Well. Co-housing communities are moving in and out too. I don't know about the marriages, but um, the, uh, the idea is that kids are being born and raised and some of them come back and some of them don't. And some people uh, move on. So it's, it's a living organism. Celebrate rituals. And I threw this one in just because I find it so intriguing. But this is not co-housing, but it's, it's a, an idea of how are, how are the things in our lives experienced? and celebrated. This is uh, in Crestone, Colorado, a little uh, town in the, in the mountains. And th they have a group there was Neighbors Helping Neighbors. And that evolved into a subset of that group called Neighbors Burning Neighbors. <laughs> and so literally, they, they have real cremations in a circle in this beautiful space. And I went to a thing, well, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can handle this. It was beautiful. And, you know, there must have been a cord of wood. And this body, the, 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 the flames rise, and everybody's telling stories and singing songs. And so I'm, I put it out there just because, I don't know if your co-housing needs to have a, an incinerator. Uh, you can use it the rest of the time for barbecue, I guess. But, uh, but I do think it's how to challenge, well, how, how could we do things differently? What are the moments? What about birth? How's birth celebrated in community? You know, is there anything left? Uh, we did original blessings out of Matthew Fox's teachings, and those were beautiful in community. But I think think through the idea of ritual and celebration uh, when you're working on your community. And if you want to burn your neighbors, um, it's a beautiful thing. I've decided that's how I want to go. So you're all invited. It's going to be great. Yeah. I think as we dry out, we probably become easier to burn, too. <laughs> uh, again, celebrating these rituals and all um, in, in, in our private world, too. So, so often we are doing homes where people want a place for quiet, for, for contemplation, for meditation. And, and those, those spaces are different. That's sacred. That's how do you tuck something away that doesn't become part of the fast pace crazy lives that we live and allows us to reconnect. So we're back to the impulses to connect. And this was a, a, a group meditation space where it then can transform into a guest bedroom with a Murphy bed. We, we like Murphy beds. Oh, we yeah. like oh. things that uh, transform. Yeah. I guess as kids we like transformers and <laughs> still do. And, and then places to play. You know, think of play as an important part of community. This is a, a Rolly Bolly court. It's a game, a drinking game at the New Belgium Brewery that we designed. And uh, it, it's a game that the more you drink, you can't control those things because you're, you're throwing it down a, a pipe. And so it's a great game to just have people loosen up. And I think that's an important part right now in the world. It's way too serious. Um, and so, the, and again, these aren't co-housing, but I threw in a few images of some small houses that we've been doing that I think are lessons learned. And this is a little off-the-grid house up near uh, Lake Eldora ski area that you can only reach by snowmobile in the winter or skiing. Um, but it's little transformable spaces. So it's about a thousand square feet, but you live in the you live in the windows, you live in the walls. You, uh, the bunko, the window seat, the uh, the day bed, those are all there. How are we doing time? I just said. Oh shit. Keep going. We'll just do some visuals. We'll just do visuals. But, and this, the, the the paneling in here too is really wonderful. It's a it's a uh, sunflower husk, 
uh, as the, the material bound oh, with a, a non VOC oh. material, and it has a glow that is just beautiful. So it's just the material. And the kitchen is a 30 inch deep one wall. Uh, it's, it's the galley kitchen uh, without the galley, it's just one wall. Uh, and it's all IKEA things above, but um, that's a side by side refrigerator, and there's a little 24 inch wolf stove there. So it has quality, and yet it's not a bunch of quantity. Um, and a net zero house for a woman who lost her house in the fire. It's a 16 foot wide house, like a little cabin. And then she wanted her room on one end and then a rental or a roommate on the other. So it's like a barbell of two bedroom suites and then this long, thin room uh, in the middle. So there's different ways to do it. We did a Zoomer house. We, we decided we wanted to try to design a house for baby boomers who are still z zesty, zippy, and full of Z-life. And so um, it was really thinking through how do we age in place and make it beautiful. Does it have to be uh, something fearful and uh, an ADA uh, uh, driven? We learn from ADA, but it's really an open, everything is open with clearance and uh, three foot doors minimal, pocketed into walls, solid core doors, you know, one of those cheap ones. I mean, if you're going to do a pocket door, do a good door, mm -hmm. um, or it won't get used. But it's really, a, there's a lot of lessons here, but I don't have time for them. But uh, <laughs> think about transformable spaces. And this is just, you know, panels that change different rooms. This is a guest space um, when it's closed, but it's an open space as a family room. Uh, so it, it's how do we use the same space to do different things, like a good Swiss Army knife. Um, and then, you know, alcoves, living in windows that can be places for reading a book, having a conversation, uh, having a, that's a guest room for some people. We've done them where we just have a, a nice sheer curtain that lets that become slightly more private. So live-in windows are, I think, really valuable use of space. And then that the kitchen is always the magnet. That's the social hub. That's where conviviality most <coughs> happens, it seems, certainly modern life. And there's one thing about a private kitchen and the social aspect of that. Co-housing kitchens, boy, acoustics are really big there. Again, transformable that you can really close it off at times so that you don't have to hear the cleanup process if yeah. you're gonna have a meeting after. So these are all things that the designers that are presenting here will be able to share with you. And then this idea of coming together around food is such an important thing. So vitality, um, this is just a project that I'm doing right now. Um, it's, this is our old studio downtown Boulder, a 1950s flat roof building that we're turning into two side-by-side -side units. But we're just learning lessons about, well, can we keep street art alive by having the, the base of the building continue to be mural walls where we'll curate young artists to come and paint murals on the building so it's changing all the time celebrating can you in density still have outdoor terraces and courtyards and then open living spaces small um, and a project we're doing in La Paz Mexico that is is trying to bring two cultures together the gringos and the locals and it's, it's more difficult than we thought. Um, and so we're learning lots of lessons. But that was also based on the, the bronchial tubes. So it's a dense community self-shading because it's so hot in the desert there. And yet opening to breezes in that. So we're, we're trying to bring density and uh, mixed use into that. This is the last thing. I had been in uh, Morocco last year with my family and we went to the Blue City. Has anybody been to the Blue City? It's unbelievable. It's a city uh, that is all like you've walked into a watercolor. And I think one of the things that you can learn from that too is to allow imperfection. And over time, let things, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time. I think we, part of that computer mentality, that this digital mentality is that everything should somehow be linear and perfect, or you'll get sued or whatever. I don't think, you know, anybody's, you know, going back and saying, did you stay within the lines on the painting? Um, it, it's water-based paint, so it, it actually bleeds on itself and changes color. So it's just a beautiful place of passages 
and doors into the possible. So, there. Thank you, David. So inspiring.